a solo selfie, I suppose you could. I can turn this around, right? Okay, there, it's turned around. Getting ready for class. Here, uh, I gotta set up the tripod, hold this. You can point it at me if you want to. This is where you start doing like a dance, right? Um, I usually don't dance until the fourth or the fifth lecture. <laughs> where we point? Which way are we pointed? Let's point it this way. I want to turn around. Nope, turn around. Turn this one around. All right. Uh, oh, you can tell it's the beginning of the term because there's a lot of people here. That's where I'm going to be. Okay. But we're going to start with some stuff over here. All right, sweet. Let's go. So, uh, did anybody watch the video from yesterday? Just now. I watched it. I watched it. Oh, this is the classroom where I'm going to be that day. So I totally watched it. And I was very disappointed. I mean, the video came out really good. Like, it was like clear. You could see everything I wrote on the board and everything like that. That part of it was not disappointing. The part that was disappointing was the fact that I had to cut out the first 15 minutes. Because there was no content in the first 15 minutes. It was all me talking about class organizational stuff. And I don't like that. So I'm going to try to not do that in the future. Um, so what are we doing today? Speed, speed, duck, and cut, right? So uh, part to part, look at the speed, speed, duck, and cut. Uh, just a few minutes ago, we sort of made an example for why you might care. So, let's just watch the video. Any more from the uh, All right, so this is a face film in one of our mini mills downstairs. It's feeding right now. And so, for our. Have you guys done science before? Have you guys done science? Science or science? Science. Have you done oh. science? Sure. Will we start the video again? Remind me to turn the volume back on. All right. Um, so, what do you do in science when you're when you're doing science? So this is this is actually for a lecture coming up. But what what do we do in science? Hypothesize. Yeah. Make observations. We make observations when. Before you do it. Sometimes, yeah. But but why why are we making observations? What's the keyword? We're doing an experiment. And so this really is manufacturing science that we're showing in the video here. Because we're doing an experiment. Now the, if you already know the answer, is it really research? Because I totally knew what the answer was before I started the experiment. But I want to do this experiment to demonstrate to you guys what the answer is. So feed speed, depth of cut, those are our three or four most important um, process variables in machining processes, right? We've said that. You, s you learned that if you did the reading. OK, feed speed, depth of cut. So for our experiment, oh, this is how I got my tangent. For the experiment, we're keeping the same feed for all of the passes. And we're keeping the same speed for all of the passes. In fact, we're feeding at 72 inches a minute. And we're spinning the spindle at 6,000 RPM, which works out to about 4,700 4700 surface feet per minute for that tool. It's a three-inch diameter tool. Three-inch diameter tool, three flutes. Um, we don't want to screw up too badly because the body of the tool costs about 600 bucks. The inserts that go in the tool cost about 20 bucks each. 
And the body's made out of aluminum, so if one of the inserts fails, the tool is done. In fact, it costs more to get them repaired than it does to replace them. Partially because of our discounts when we buy a pair than a guy. But um, all right, so feed speed depth of guy. So if we kept the speed the same and the feed the same in our experiment, what did we vary? Depth of cut. All right, so the first pass, the one we just watched, 10 thousandths of an inch. So 0 0.01 inches. One of the things we'll do in the class is we'll learn how to talk like a machinist or talk like a manufacturing engineer. So our depth here is 10. If a manufacturing engineer or a machinist says a number without units afterwards, they mean thousandths of an inch. So if I say it's a tenth, what do I mean? A tenth of a thousand. A tenth of a thousandth of an inch or a ten thousandth of an inch. So if it's six tenths, it's point zero 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 six, not point zero six. Point zero six is sixty thousand. All right, so our depth here was ten thousand. And so, oh, 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 what were you supposed to remind me? Turn the volume back on. And what I'm going to do, yeah, we might get some feedback if I stand in the wrong place. But, uh, all right, back it up here. Let's just start it again in the beginning. So, there's a couple things going on. I want you to listen to the spindle. And I want you to listen or watch the power meter in the lower right hand corner. I'll try not to talk too much. Go. All right, so that's 10 now. Full width of cut. 100% engagement. That's 20 thou depth of cut. Notice the spin the load went up. So it's, a, it's an experiment, right? What are our observations from the experiment? Yes. What's Leon. your name? Leon. Leon. I got you. Leon. Leon. Um, the deeper the cut, the lower the, or the higher the spindle. So we observe immediately that more depth of cut gives us more spindle load. Okay, what else? Anybody observe anything else? Yeah. Um, the size of the tread is larger than the depth of cut. Oh, look at that. And if you look at the end of the video, here's the 10 thou chip, here's the 20 thou chip, here's the 50 thou chip. So, yeah, the chips get larger and impact the window with more force, too. You notice I was shaking when they were in the window on the last one? Yeah. Chips get larger and impact the window with more force. Seems like probably inertia, more mass. It's more inertia when it hits the window. Okay, anything else that anybody noticed? Did you hear the frequency of the spindle? Yeah. Would you believe that the frequency that you hear coming off that spindle motor is directly related to the speed at which it's rotating? Yeah. Yeah, because noise happens that way, right? So that frequency, the higher the frequency, the faster the RPMs. Now the programmed RPM for all of the cuts was 6,000 RPM. As the tool got into the workpiece, that 50 thou depth of cut, the spindle slowed down. And, and you notice the power meter went up into the red, right? It went up above, what, where's the red on the power meter? The yellow from, let me see it. You can't really see it, but if you, if you look here, this is 50%. This is 100%, that's 150%, that's 185%. Why do you think those are the numbers? Shouldn't it go like, shouldn't the max be 100%? Wouldn't that make more sense? Yeah. It's totally for marketing. Mm -hmm. And so the salespeople can say, you can run this machine at 150% load all day long, and it won't hurt the machine. This one goes totally to 11. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> exactly. We can turn the dial all the way up to 11 on this one. All right, so, so between 100 and 150% spindle load, the Hawes tells us that this machine is okay as long as it's not constantly at 150% for like seven hours in a row. If it's doing this up and down, you can be between 100 and 150%, no problem. Above 150% up to 200%, you've got to worry, be worried that something's going to break. So these are actually set to shut off at 185. So if the power hits 185%, that spindle would have stopped. They would have thrown an alarm message. It would have said, whoop, whoop, danger, Will Robinson. Right? They would have told us something was wrong. So all right, let me get a better camera angle now. Now if you want to see the stuff that's up there, you'll have to uh, be on the echo capture instead of the UG light. If it slows, what would happen? So I said, if it slows down too much, it'll stop, right? Okay. What will that do to your part? Oh, why do? Why does it stop? Why do we have a shutdown? Show the alarm. Yeah. So we don't break the tooling. So we don't break the tooling. So we don't break the machine. So we don't damage that spindle motor because it wants to spin at speed. Okay. So speed, speed, depth. Are those the only process you're able to manufacture? No. no we, we, they're impactful partly because they control how those chips form on the ends of the tool. And they, they, they really control how the chips form on the ends of the tool. So they're important to us there for that reason. So what are... So let's, for right now, focus on <coughs> machining. Hey, we already got B speed done the cut. How far over can I go? And you're started. Okay. All right, so we got B speed done the cut. Can you do some more process variables? things that the manufacturing engineer and the machinist control that will impact the quality of our parts. What else you got? Yes. Um, yeah. you the tooling? The, the, the tooling that we choose. So let's call that tool geometry. But it's not just the geometry, right? What else does matter? What else matters? Yeah. The tool material, yeah, we'll call it material. And, and with material, let's include coatings. Uh, why, why do we put coatings on cutting tools? Anybody know? Yep. To reduce friction and dissipate. So one reason would be to change the friction coefficient between the cutting surface and the workpiece, or the, the chip that's forming on the edge of the tool. Um, and you said also to help dissipate heat. Yeah. yeah. Any other reason we put a coating on a tool? Um, finish. <laughs> so I think, yeah. So to so change the surface finish of the tool, which is going to impact its ability to so the friction mostly. I think. What else? One more reason. Yeah. Okay. I suppose it could protect it from rust, but that's not why. And, and the carbide tooling that we use won't rust anyway. Um, why else might we put a coating on the tool? So you want it to reduce friction and reduce friction and dissipate heat differently. You want it to change the surface finish, which will tend to reduce friction. Why else? Make the tool more durable or perhaps less durable. 
we might, might want to make the tool harder. So, so we'll change the hardness. So for durability, and it's kind of nitpicking the, the term here, but for durability, we usually mean like resistance to impact and things like that. And the bulk material usually supplies the durability of the tool, whereas the coating would increase the hardness of the tool. Um, so coating's hardness, um, friction, and maybe heat. I'm not sure it's so much the heat dissipation as the reduced friction makes it generate less heat. Um, all right, so then to make diamond coated carbide tooling. So carbide in itself, silicon carbide, is one of the hardest materials in the world. So we put diamond coatings on it. In fact, the only material you can use to cut silicon carbide is diamond. So if you need to grind or cut silicon carbide, you have to cut it with diamond. Put a diamond coating on a silicon carbide tool to make it a little bit harder. What kind of materials are the diamond coated silicon carbide tools in for? Anybody? Yeah. Um, so I mean, you're using them to cut dental specimens, yeah. So what what materials though, not not what parts? Liana wants to cut steel. Ceramics. Um, maybe ceramics, but typically we grind ceramics. Um, steel, yeah. You're typically not gonna give. Yes, we'll use plated tooling for plated tooling with diamonds on it to cut silicon carbide. Um, but there's there's one that's out there. It's low hanging fruit that we use diamond coated silicon carbide tools for all the time. I, uh, no, not so much. Yeah. Do you use it to cut other diamonds? No. Yeah. Aluminum. Aluminium. British friends say, right? Aluminium. So with diamond coated silicon carbide tooling or diamond coated carbide tooling, we can fill buckets with chips when we're cutting aluminum. And we should not cut steel. Anybody know why we should not cut steel with diamond coated tooling? Yes. <laughs> so steel is a ferrous material, yeah. Um, that's not the main reason though. Yeah, sparks. Uh, no, we don't really care about the sparks. Sparks are cool, though. Sparks are definitely cool. Um, so, what makes steel different from iron? Yes. Because it's carbon and other things in it. Yeah, to make to take iron and turn it into steel, we had to have to add carbon to the iron. What's diamond made out of? Carbon. 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 Would you believe that there's a significantly high temperature that happens at that chip tool interface? Yeah. What happens to chemical reactions at high temperature, some of them? They speed up, right? So that steel part will suck all the diamond right off the tool. It will absorb it into the steel, make the steel harder, um, and then the next pass, the tool will probably break. So we don't use any these diamond coated tools on steel. But yeah, all right, so tool material, coatings, hardness, friction, yeah. So why? Oh, because the tool will never wear out if we're cutting kind of like all day long. It, 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 so we, we do this hardness here and, and also wear resistance. Yeah. All right, so PCB, depth of cut, tool geometry, tool material, those are big ones. What else do we got? Pro process variables and manufacturing. What else we got? In machining specifically, let's start with. Anything else? You guys have started using the CAM software, right? Mm -hmm. Have you created operations yet, or is that probably not the next yet. one? Some, some of you may have finished the first one, you started the creating operations one. How about CAM software? Is that a process variable to manufacture? Do you know that there are literally a thousand companies that make CAM software? As machinists and manufacturing engineers, we have to choose which CAM package we want to use. It's a variable for sure. Is it a process variable? They don't all calculate the tool paths the same way. 
So I mean, it, it really gets down to this speed-speed Depakot, the axial radial Depakot. Um, but yeah, game software. There's a process variable in manufacturing and machining. What else? Yeah, lubricant. Coolant or lubricant. Okay, what else? What else is a process variable? What else do we get to choose? Yes? Is the workpiece material a process variable in manufacturing? It certainly impacts how the chips are formed. It certainly impacts our choice for PCB depth and tooling material, but is it a process variable? Who defines the workpiece material? Or the designer, right? So the manufacturing engineer is responsible for process variables. We're going to call them PDs, process variables. The designer is responsible for design parameters. Right? The design parameters should define what the customer wants. That's the purpose of the design parameters, is to tell the manufacturing engineer what it is the customer wants. So now, uh, when we're doing prototyping, when we're WPI students, frequently we are the designer and the manufacturer. Do you believe that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But we're wearing the designer hat when we pick the workpiece material. Yes? I was just about to say, though, what kind of CNC machine you're using? Which tools? So if we did that same cutting experiment, so I did that on a mini mill. You guys use the VM2 for your first lab. Everybody's done the first lab now pretty much? Yeah, so you guys use the VM2 for one of the processes on that first lab. You had that big three inch diameter face mill with four inserts. And how long did it take to cut the part? Ish? Five minutes. Five minutes. Yeah, we did about, it, it's a pretty big part. So if we had done the same cutting experiment on the VM2 where you used, where you did that, you would not have noticed an increase in spindle load nor a spindle slowdown on the 50,000 after cut. You know what that tool is actually, if you go to the tooling manufacturer and, and they say, what can this tool do? Because they like to brag about what their tools can do. You know what that tool's rated for? Anyone want to guess? Maximum depth of cut? Anyone want to guess? So we saw a 50 thou pretty much stole the mini mill spindle. I'm going to guess 100 thou. You're going to guess 100 thou. Anybody have another guess? About 250 thou. 250, you're getting closer. 375. 375, you're getting closer. Yeah, 400. Right around there, a little bit more than that, half or 10 millimeters, which is just about a half an inch. Wow. So that tool is rated for 10 millimeters deep, 90 inches a minute through the material at 8,300 RPM. Wow. If your machine tool can generate enough watch, horsepower. That VM2, I don't know if you noticed on the side, it says 30 horsepower vector drive. So the spindle motor there has 30 horsepower. Spindle motor in the Haas mini mill, about six and a half, and that's at about 4,000 RPM. So it's falling off by the time it gets to 6,000 RPM. So we were probably four horsepower, peak horse, peak load on that part. This is a big difference, like almost, almost 10 times, like eight times. So yeah. So which machine tool? This doesn't look like it's spelled right. Did I spell which correctly? Yeah. yeah. This looks weird. Did I spell machine correctly? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, which machine tool you choose is an important process variable? Get the burring. Um, whether or not we do the burring? You mean? What's the process? That's, we can add a process. So, yeah. All right. I'll put in edge break. Whether or not we do that edge break in the machine or as a secondary process. Yep. So like operation selection. 
Which which type of operation? As you want to know. Uh, yeah, it's not just if you want a miller lathe. There might be more than one way in a mill that you could make the same feature. So yeah, it's operation selection definitely. The order in which you do the operations. <coughs> order of operations, what else? Yeah. Fine versus conventional. Uh, yeah, so fine versus conventional. So I'm going to put that in there. Who doesn't know what this means? Don't be shy. OK. I figured if nobody raised their hands, I didn't have to explain it. So in climb milling, all right, so what happens to make cutting happen? You remove material. We remove material. That's the result of cutting. What happens to make the material get removed? Yes? Interaction between the flute and the material. Right. There's a relative motion between the cutting edge of the tool, the flute, and the material. Right? And so what causes? the most of that relative motion? Yep. The spindle spinning. The spindle spinning. Spinning the tool, right? So we've got a spinning tool. If we're climb milling, the rotation of the tool will tend to pull the tool into the part. Just a moment. <laughs> it restabilize. <laughs> if we're conventional milling, the rotation of the tool will tend to push the tool away from the part. So that flute, so if, if this is the edge of the part, as I'm going along the, the side, so we're side milling here. If that's the edge of the part, Clyde milling will tend to pull me into the part. Conventional milling will tend to push me away from the part. Who's ever run an Etch-a-Sketch style machine tool? You know, with the two handles, move them around. Raise your hands high, be proud. Can you make a good circle? Yeah, it's hard to make circles on that to sketch, right? But I, I mean a manual, I mean a manual mill here in specifics when we're talking about climb and conventional milling. Um, typically, in a manual machine tool, we'll do conventional milling process, which is why they call it conventional because we had manual machine tools before we had CNC machine tools. So typically, we'll do a conventional milling process because it's better for us when we're. So I'm manually turning a hand crank that's pushing the work the tool through the workpiece. That, that's what that's what's going on. There's a mechanical advantage, but I'm turning the crank, it's connected to a nut on a table, it's moving the table across there. So I'm manually turning that. It's better for me, it's a more stable operation when I'm doing that, if the tool's trying to push me backwards. Right? If the tool's trying to push me backwards, I'm gonna try harder to get into the machine, right? To get more material removed. If the motion of the tool is trying to pull me into it, it could get away from me. Anybody use it like a, a table saw, a radial arm saw? Have you ever had, especially with ripping on a radial arm saw, have you ever had it try to pull the board away from you? Mm -hmm. Same idea. Which is why you should also conventional cut there. You should have it try to push it away from you, push it back to you instead of pull away from you. But, okay, um, where am I? Oh, in, on the other hand, climb milling makes for much more efficient chip removal. Climb milling is a better process for the physics of the process, not for the control of turning the handles. That's why we use it on CNC's, right? CNC machine tools can generate thousands of pounds of thrust with their servo motors that control the axes. On the CNC machine tool, as long as it's a stiff enough machine, now if you've got a a wobbly little handmade router thing, homemade CNC machine, you might still want a conventional mill. But if you've got a stiff enough machine, you're going to climb mill because it's a more efficient cutting process. All right, um, so climb versus conventional. What else we got for process variables in machining? Yes? I guess the quality of your operator. <laughs> As someone who owns a machine shop and has employees, I can attest that that is an important <laughs> process variable. Which operator do you put on the machine? What else? All people may be created equal, but not all CNC operators. 
process inspection and so maybe frequency is more important uh, or is the important thing there when how often do you check the parts that are coming off the machine because you, you guys just get it we're making well if we're making 10,000 parts an hour we're probably not doing a full inspection on each part as it comes off the machine you believe that in fact, we might check one part every hour to see if the parts are good. And if they're not, we might have scrapped 10,000 parts. Right? But yeah. The connection would also be an operator with that inspection frequency because if you yeah. have something to try. Exactly. Are you stealing my table? You're totally stealing my table. Is that pizza for me? actually not but if you guys want to become uh, materials or manufacturing graduate students when this class is over they totally have pizza for lunch right at the end of this class <laughs> all right um, all right so give me some more process variables things that we can control things that are important that are going to impact the finished part the part that we ship to the customer because we do not want to ship crap to the customer right the customer does not want to pay for crap well, unless they're buying crap, but the fertilizer maybe. What do you got? Packaging. Yeah, I'm already talking about. What do you got? Process variables, things that impact the the value added operations. Yes. Like the calibration tool, how many tools do you guys use the products? Uh, it's just I think you got it. It's in here. Like the calibration between of the tools that you use each product to product to vary. Oh yeah. So next week in lab, you guys are going to be doing some. Uh, lab exercises where you practice setting up the machine. You realize the hardest part about making a part of a CNC machine is setting up the machine. Mm -hmm. Is putting the work piece in the machine and loading the program on the controller. Having it be the program that you intended to load on the controller. That's the thing we check for. Um, and then telling the machine where the work piece is about all the tools. That's actually the most difficult part of this. And um, next week you'll be using an automated probing system in the machine to locate the work pieces and to measure the tools. The calibration of that probing system is certainly a process variable. Uh, or that's, that's, the, that's the obvious one. Um, what if the, so you get an X and Y table that move the workpiece around in our milling machine. What if they're skewed to each other? What if they're not actually at 90 degrees? You could work around it in software if you know how much they're skewed. But, um, but that's a problem, right? Okay, so calibration. What else we got? Quickly, what else you got? Uh, maybe the status of the machine. Status of the machine, like how old it is? Yes. So, how about the status? Let's say we're making turned parts on the lathe, right? As we're doing our in-process inspection of our turned parts on the lathe, we're doing an OD turning operation. Somebody describe to me what an OD turning operation does. Yes? It removes material from the outside of the spinning part, right? We're doing our OD turning operation. In our in-process inspection, we notice that the part's getting bigger. <laughs> What happened? The work is not being held correctly. Not like, it, it, you it's wouldn't notice that right away. All right. Uh, the tool's moving out. The tool's moving, it's, you know, here at WPI, you know we have 1,600 individual users of our equipment. 
Last year, 1,600 people came in the lab and made something. So here at WPI, that actually might be what happened. Somebody might not have tightened the bolt that was holding the tool in place. And the tool may be getting pushed away over time. But that's probably not what it is in production. Yeah? So it's wearing out. The tool, radius, the tool does radius is wearing out. So people on Echo are screwed. But I have another blackboard. So let's look at our, our turning here. Right, so here's my workpiece. It's rotated this way. Where's the tool gonna be? We put the tool down here. Right, so my tool's there, feeding in this direction. Just quickly, what's the depth of cut? Thirty depth. I didn't mean pick a number, but okay, thanks. Um. <laughs> uh, so let's call this D O for original. Let's call this D. F for final. What's the depth of cap? Yes. D O minus D F over for two. Equals D O C as long as we remember to divide by two because it's symmetrical and we're only taking. Yeah. All right, you guys got that. All right, feed this way. As the tool wears out, let's say that this is unobtainium 42. <laughs> And the tool is wearing out as it goes along the workpiece. It's unlikely to notice wear from year to year. But as the tool wears out, so over here, oops, over here the tool was this big. Over here, the tool is this big because it wore out the nose of it. If it's linear, As the tool wears out, the part gets bigger. Probably won't happen in one pass. Unless it's unobtainium. Was it 42? Yeah. Unobtainium 42. Okay, so as tool wears, um, what else happens as the tool wears? Anybody? Yes? You increase its potential on breaking. Why? I agree. You increase the potential for the tool breaking. Why? Yes? There are actually little micro cracks that form in the edge of the tool, but that's not the one I was going for. Yes? The tool geometry is different? The tool geometry changes, yes. It's not as sharp as the also. It's not as sharp. What happens when the, what do you imagine happens when the tool becomes less sharp? It gets caught. Uh, it caught the wrong word. What's that? There's more load on it. There's more load on it. What happens? So, where does the heat in the cutting process come from? You know, the tools wear out mostly because they get hot. Where does the heat in the cutting process come from? Sorry. Speed of moving. The, the speed of moving, or that's that's part of it, but... Uh, there's more surface area, but yeah, the heat in the cutting operation comes from the friction, right? So as the tool gets dull, the cutting force goes up. What's friction depend on? Friction coefficient and what? Normal force, right? So our, as our tool goes up, because the tool got dull, there's going to be even more friction, which is going to make the heat go even higher, and so the tool's going to fail because you didn't change it soon enough. Um, what else we got? Status of the tool, what's missing? Um, time of day. Or you could call it the fire. Day. We could say day of week. Which day of the week do you think we have more bad parts? Friday. Friday. Why is that? Get out. Everybody wants to go home, and Thursday was payday, so they went out drinking last night. <laughs> I kid you not, I have friends who have had to go bail out their operators from jail to get them to work on Friday because they had to make production, and that was the guy that knew how to make that part. <laughs> It happens. Um, day of the week is important. Um, actually, I did a I did a project that was another company that had a different problem. Their failure rate skyrocketed after the Red Sox lost. Yeah, after the Red Sox lost a game, failure rate would skyrocket. You want to know why? Anybody any guesses as to why? Yeah. Sports betting. 
No, no, it wasn't sports betting. That wouldn't be nice. It's even, it's even more, uh, yeah, what do you got? Yeah, you know, it, that may have happened, but that wasn't what we determined the root cause to be. It was a visual inspection process. There's a guy named, I don't know, Joe, Jimmy, Freddie. There's a guy that would do this. They say, yeah, that's a good part. Put it on the pile. If the Red Sox lost, he was angry the next day. When you're angry, it's easier to find flaws. Anyone ever notice that? <laughs> that's a bad part. Throw away. So we replaced Joe, Freddy, Jimmy, I can't remember what the guy's name was. We replaced him with a laser and then some light sensor and stuff like that. <laughs> 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 just the speed along the park, the reflection would change at just the right rate. And as long as we trained the machine on a day that the Red Sox won, we could get much now. So so yeah, there's um it's messed up. Time of day. Oh, why does time of day matter? Yeah. Yeah. Um well it, you know, you'd think that, but it's, it's not really on the operator so much. Time day matters to the machine tool, too. Yes? Temperature. Temperature changes over time, right? Especially if there's a window. If the sun's shining on the machine, the machine will grow. Um, I, have a, I have an operation that I was doing, because we made a couple hundred of those parts. The operation itself took 24 hours of cut time on those parts. In one seven hour cut, my spindle would grow by a thousandth of an inch. <laughs> so I had to I had to tool the program to make the tool get shorter over time so that my depth wouldn't be too big in the last pass. So so heat will also make makes metal expand. The the spin the uh, the mechanism got so hot the spindle would grow about a thousandth of an inch which is significant when the tolerance on the part was half a thou for height. What else we got? Anything else important? All these things impact, but yes. Um, the weather. Um, yeah, yeah, the weather, the humidity. Have you ever had to try to dry paint on a day like this? <laughs> Latex paint does not dry well today. I can tell you that for sure. Um, all of those things matter. Now, let's think, we've got a few minutes, let's think about some other manufacturing processes because although these are the processes that we're gonna study in this class and we're gonna focus on this. By the way, why is it that we do machining in this class? Do we do we did this on the first day? Why is it that our primary focus is on machining in this class? Anybody know? There's two really good reasons. Yes. Much more intuitive. Yeah, for some people. Yes. Because in additive manufacturing, you don't have to care about a lot of these things. I would disagree. <laughs> um, yes. So that's a reason we want you to learn how to use the machines, but the, the, it's, it's deeper than that, right? Yes. Because like this is the way most of the things in the world are made now. This is the way almost everything in the world is made. Anything that you can buy right now is not more than two, three max steps away from a CNC machine that did cutting operations. This table, all right, so the fasteners that hold it to the floor, those were cut on a CNC machine tool. The pipe that are fastened down to the floor, that was cut with a cutting process, it was Bent, it was bent on a machine that was made by machining parts on CNC machine tools. The wood, well, is it really wood? It's particle board. The wood product that makes up the density of that tabletop, that was first ground up with blades that were cut on a CNC machine tool. It was then stamped together in some sort of a form the parts of that were made with the CNC machine tool. The table, you get, you get the idea, right? It's the most important manufacturing process in the world today, and it will go on to be, despite additive manufacturing, which is really good at making near net shape parts, which then get finished machined. Um, what else? Oh, and the other reason was, uh, I forget, it's Gus, right? Yeah. Yeah, Gus. 
Gus's reason that we want you to be able to use these in future classes and to do your MQP and stuff. The other reason is because we're kind of good at it. And we have lots of CNC machine tools, so it's easy for us to teach you that. So, two reasons. One is because it's really important, and two, because we're kind of good at it. Uh, what else we got? Time of day, uh, sunlight, all that stuff. Whoop. Let's talk about some other manufacturing processes. First, blue hat. What's your name? Arcadi. Say it again? Arcadi. Arcadi. Girl sitting next to Arcadi. What's your name? Agasha. Agasha. Arcadi, Agasha. Agasha. Name two manufacturing processes that are not CNC machining. Oh, come on. Somebody help her out. Welding. He says welding. Do you want to name welding? All right, welding could be your first one. What's another one? What do you got? Casting. Casting, OK. Welding, casting, what else we got? Laser cutting. Laser cutting is sort of CNC machining, but OK. I'll give you that one. Bending is a manufacturing process. Work hardening. Hard, well, yeah. Heat okay. treating, work hardening, all those things, manufacturing processes. <laughs> Coating stuff is a manufacturing process, so painting. What else? Yes. Adding electronics. Assembly. That we, that's typically when you're putting the chips on the board. That's, that's really an automated assembly process, but yeah. The soldering that holds them to the board is another process. Yes. Sintering. Sintering. Yep. You guys know what centering is? No. So you typically you'll take some powdery material, some binder material, press it together into a shape. And at this point, we have a green part. We put it into a furnace, and it heats up, and the molecules melt together, the stuff melts together, the binder holds the powder together, and it becomes a hard part. So a centering process where you use heat to bind stuff to fuse stuff together after you bond it together. Were you going to say anything else? No? Okay. Uh, sanding? Sanding is an abrasive process which is very similar to C to, uh, to machining. We call So we call this CNC machining stuff that we're doing is turning and milling. We call this chip formation by, or material removal by large chip formation. Sanding and grinding we call material removal by small chip formation. But it's the same physics in the back end of it. And yeah, absolutely. You had something? Yes, go. Packaging is a manufacturing process. I have a, uh, a guy I used to know was the head of manufacturing at Lotus, not the car company, the software company. You guys know what Lotus was? Lotus 1, 2, 3. Lotus 1, 2, 3. Oh, God. It was Excel before Excel was Excel. It's a software company, it's a spreadsheet company. He was the head of manufacturing at a software company. Huh. What did he do? CDs. It was actually floppy disk time. Oh. They put software on floppy disks, they put floppy disks in packages, they shipped packages. There was real manufacturing needs for software companies back in the day. Um, all right, so all of these other processes have their own sets of <coughs> process variables, right? We could, we could sit here, we could do a, a list like this for welding, right? We could sit here, we could do a list like this for casting. What do you think is important in casting? Really the most important, besides the shape of the mold that you're casting into? But you guys know what casting is, right? Big hot metal or hot plastic or something like that poured into some mold. Um, so the composition of the material is, is important, but what's, what's, what's really important in, in a process where you're pouring hot stuff into the mold? Yeah. Whether your mold gets destroyed. Yeah, whether the mold gets destroyed. Temperature differences. Temperature differences, right? So we need the stuff to cool at the correct rate because stuff shrinks when it cools. So we need to control the cooling rate of the material after we pour it in. We also need to control the temperature of the liquid stuff when we're pouring it in. My wife used to be a manufacturing engineer at Tiffany and Company. They had, a, they had an issue, um, so, you know, they don't like melt gold bars to make gold jewelry. First, they melt gold bars and make little, like, pea-sized 
pieces of gold so that when they go to make their jewelry, they don't have to um, build a whole gold bar if they're not using that much gold. That makes sense? So the process of making the little pea-sized bits of gold is called graining. And so when they were graining, well, actually, no, when they were in production, they found that they had problems with some of the gold jewelry. She inspected it. She had to do metallographical analysis. She found out the alloy was wrong. There was too much copper in the alloy. She traced it back to the graining process. And the operator said that might have been the time we melted the thermocouple in the bolt. <laughs> now, they put a thermocouple in the gold so they'll know how hot the molten gold is, because there's an appropriate temperature that you don't want to go over, otherwise you can have other chemical processes happen. That was supposed to be much slower than the melting point for copper. It might have been the time we melted the thermocouple. <laughs> Now, that's an operator problem, right? Because if they had said, shit, we screwed up, we melted a thermocouple in the gold, they wouldn't have used that batch in production, would they? They might have sent it out to get refined so that it was gold again instead of too much copper in the gold. Operator problems, they happen. Uh, tomorrow, what are we talking about? Anybody remember? Anybody? We're going we're gonna to continue this topic, but instead of process variables, tomorrow we're going to talk about from the process variable that we input into the CAM software to the machine. We're going to talk about that NC code and that that's gap between the machine and the uh, CAM software. It's very similar to lab one, right? Lesson one in the CAM. So right now I'm going to go back to post because. Yes. There was one time where my dad has a friend who is in Germany who is like a packaging engineer. Okay. He stayed at my house one night when I had like a big science project in physics.